generously, Richard uh, Christensen um, agreed to, to fill in. Um, and you will not be disappointed with today's speaker. I can, I can promise you that. So like as I was saying by way of background, uh, he has a degree in electrical engineering uh, and a master's in business administration from a university to the north of here. Um, and enough said there. <laughs> he is currently the chair of the board of trustees. When I was a student, I couldn't tell the difference between, there's all these academic titles, there's uh, department chairs and deans and uh, uh, provosts and all these obscure titles. The chair of the board of trustees, the board of trustees oversees the office of the president and, and Rich is the chair of, of the board of trustees here at SUU. Um, he is the founder of the Entrepreneur Leadership Council or the ELC, many of you have heard of this. Rich is single-handedly responsible for the entrepreneurship program at, at SUU. So what does he know about entrepreneurship? Uh, he knows quite a bit. Rich has started 50-something uh, businesses, 16 of which he has turned into multi-million dollar successes. Uh, his book, Zigzag Principle, uh, achieved New York Times bestseller status and this is a book where he lays out how uh, you get a, a startup to be successful, something about which he knows uh, a great deal. Uh, two, two kind of last thoughts. One is that as the, the chair of the Board of Trustees, he works tirelessly on behalf of Southern Utah University and, and you students. Uh, also the faculty and the staff, he is um, he, he genuinely does more for the university than anybody knows, um, and, and, I, and I'm grateful for his service. And everything that I've said there is, is good reason to listen to Rich, but what I will say next is the best, res, le, best reason to listen to, to what Rich has to say, which is that I've never met anyone more committed to following his conscience than Rich Christensen, which makes him the most righteous person that I know. Please welcome Rich Christensen. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Thank you. Much appreciated. Thank you. All right. So here's the deal. You guys got ripped off. Uh, I would be totally ticked to the point that I would uh, ask for a refund for this class. Okay, let's see. Stephen Hirth, multi-billionaire, Rich Christensen. Uh, Stephen Hirth, uh, international connector and peacemaker, Rich Christensen. So <laughs> I just uh, pre-apologize. This is Stephen uh, called me. Um, I'm very, very blessed to form a dear relationship with Stephen. And I think actually he was the ultimate speaker that we would have had to the speaker series yet. Uh, after hearing about Southern in Utah University at a really interesting forum where together we, d we developed a, a, a deep friendship and he says I'm going to come down and he's far more to go I'm going to come down and visit your university Rich uh, if you'll let me fly the helicopters and I said done deal <laughs> so when I got the call uh, yesterday morning that uh, I'm still testing positive for COVID and it's like ah so here I am uh, that being said I, I love you guys I'm a believer of youth I've spent my entire up? I feel like I'm screaming already. Uh, I've spent my entire career fighting for the youth and fighting for the youth. And one of my biggest gripes is, is, is everyone painting this picture that, oh, the world's ending. Oh, it's so sad. Never has there been a time more evil than this time. Never has there been a harder time than this time, right? You guys feeling that? Oh, COVID, it's the end of the world. How, who feels that way a little bit? Seriously, uh, be honest with me a little bit. Are you hearing a lot of that? Well, I want to put that to bed, you guys. I want to put it to bed and tell you that that's a bunk, a bunch of bunk. Never have we lived, despite COVID, despite Ukraine, never have we lived at a more hopeful time. Never have we lived at a time with more opportunity. And yeah, we got our challenges, but most of them are not the challenges you guys face. Um, who of you would like to go back to great grandpa's time and live back then? 
How do you feel about wiping your rear end in minus 20 degrees in an outhouse with the Sears and Robot catalog? And when the Sears and Robot catalog's not available, let's use some uh, sagebrush or pine needles, huh? Okay, who's wanting to go back to that? Who wants to go back to cars and buggies? Now, with it presents some opportunities. Now, here's the truth. Um, and I know this COVID thing was a little bit of disruption, but it's not the first time. And uh, uh, we've never lived in a time, actually, even with this war, with less war, with less disease, with more opportunity. Oh my gosh, I've founded 51 businesses now. If I'd lived in you guys' shoot, it would have been 151. And uh, I don't know what it would have liked, but it would have been really good. So please have faith and hope in your future. Uh, as I thought what I would uh, talk about a little bit today, I wanted to first of all tell a little bit of my background and story and, and share a little bit of that. But uh, this is going to be a hodgepodge, it's going to be potpourri of just some of the, I think, the best counsel and uh, guidance that I would give you and suggestion I'd give you to have a good life, to have a fulfilled life. I grew up in, oh, I got to back up also. One thing is, yes, I graduated from another university, but I've kissed my wife on every single bench that there is on this campus, and most of them a lot more than that and more than once. So I, I actually dropped out of uh, college to come down here and chase my wife, and uh, it was the very best marketing job that I've ever done. So I managed to convince her to marry me. I went down to Southern United University, and indeed it was the best education that I received in my six years of education. There was this professor named Dr. Wolf that taught philosophy. He'd had a couple of his fingers cut off, and, he'd kept, and you're just mesmerized. And so uh, this is a special place, you guys. And uh, the attitude of students first is not common, and don't take it for granted. And I, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that maybe in a minute. So I grew up in Beaver, Utah. Um, and uh, I, I always jokingly say there's 2,000 of us if you count the cows. And in all transparency, I was the nerd. I was the unpopular kid. I spent more time in a locker hanging by my belt buckle from the back of a coat rack or in a garbage can than I did walking the halls, okay? Uh, I was the weird little kid that all I really wanted to do is I wanted to sell something. I'm ordering burpee seeds and going through the neighborhood trying to sell stuff. Or I'm uh, uh, creating a lawn mowing business or selling night crawlers or anything to hustle. And I liked golf balls and I couldn't figure it out. I honestly, sorry if there's anyone from Beaver here, but I had no interest in riding, in, in riding a bowl. I was like, they were, that's going to step on me and kill me. So I kind of felt like I didn't fit there. And, and in a lot of ways, it was really a hard growing up. And my confidence uh, was, it wasn't super high. It was pretty darn low. And uh, I recall when I was uh, 15, maybe 16 years old, I got a job working out at a gas station because there's really only three jobs that you can do. And so I was uh, hustling some hustling at a gas station. And the, the, the guy who owned the gas station was this tough, gruff kind of guy. And uh, his name is Ray Allen Yardley. I, I anyone from Beaver here? OK, well, Ray Allen Yardley was this individual, and he had become a young man leader. And uh, I was overhearing that there was some kids kind of making fun of me in the next room. And Ray Allen walked up there and said a couple of words that I can't say in this classroom or ever again, and says, you better be nice to that kid. You better be nice to Rich, because he's going to be a millionaire. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Knock me over with a feather, that here's this tough, gruff, big six foot, like three guy that just had identified that I'm gonna be a millionaire. I hadn't even thought, as a matter of fact, my whole goal in life was can I make it through tomorrow without getting pantsed? That was my entire goal in life at that point. So at that point, it's like, whoa, he actually thinks and sees something. It's the first time that someone believed in me. To this day, I can't tell you how grateful I am for Ray Howen Yardley, because he believed in me. And that's the first advice I want to give you today. Get a mentor. Get someone that believes in you, and believe in yourself above all else, even if you're a weird little kid getting pantsed. The result is, is indeed, I've lived a stellar life. Oh my gosh, if you told me when I was in Beaver, Utah, hanging from the coat rack, 
that I'd create 51 bits. I got the coolest life of anyone I know. There's not one person. You pick any one person on this earth to trade places with, I wouldn't trade places with them. I've traveled the world backwards and forward, inside, upside, downside. I, I'm a multimillionaire. I'm not a millionaire. I'm a multimillionaire. I'm, I'm not the richest guy that you ever met, but I've been fairly successful. And I've lived this storied, wonderful, rich, rich, deep life that was kind of accidental, but kind of also not accidental. And so what, I, what I'd like to do today is just randomly share a couple of little cheat codes with you. And I already gave you the first one. Does that sound OK? And if you guys will, if you're interested, give me your eyeballs and don't fall asleep. And if you aren't, then uh, uh, close your eyes and please don't distract me. <laughs> so I gave you the first one. The single most predictive thing in my life and anyone's life that I found is, is someone that believes in you. And I've been very, very blessed to have amazing mentors in my life. I've had four. The first person that really believed me was Ray Allen Yardley. And uh, my first experience, and I wasn't going to tell that story, but maybe I will tell it in honor of the Allen Hall Scholarship. I was this young kid. Are you guys okay if I tell a couple of personal stories before I get to the advice? Is that okay? So uh, I had married. I'd managed to pull off the marketing act of the world and marry my wife. We got married, and I had a Dodge Colt that had been totaled three times that I brought to the marriage and $500, and that's all that there was to my contribution, okay? <laughs> so I pulled off this spectacular marketing gig, got her to marry. We moved up north. We didn't even have an apartment to live. By hook or crook, we found a place. Uh, it was so bad that the toilet, you couldn't even sit. You had to turn sideways, and even then you were like feet were halfway up on the shower wall. My sister-in-law uh, would say, your apartment scares me. It was like, it was a dive of all dives. <laughs> but nonetheless, we were living there, and I got this job at a company called Netline. And I was just kind of like a little uh, peon kind of guy there. I was kind of in early stage uh, technical support. I was studying electrical engineering. And uh, uh, I, I would work really hard and really in integrity. Uh, I always just really made sure I was putting in a, a really strong effort. And one day as we were getting ready to leave the building, I was down in a basement, they had this big presentation of like five computers sitting together. You guys can't believe it, but in the point, you used to always have to connect computers to get them to talk together. And even that, that was a big deal. And so uh, that's what was going on. And there was this really fancy pants guy named Ray Norda coming in to invest a couple of million dollars. And so as I'm walking by it, I thought, man, that's, that looks like garbage. It's like my mom taught me to clean up better than that. And so uh, Gay had just come in to pick me up in that Dodge Colt that I had told you about. And it says, oh, this is terrible, help me. So uh, we tied all the bundles of the cords, we cleaned all the monitors, polished it up, got the vacuum up, vacuumed up, spent 20 minutes, didn't think another thought about it. And the next day, uh, Rainwater came in, they did the presentation, and the company uh, ended up getting the $2 million. I never said one word about that vacuuming the floor uh, situation. And, uh, there was this guy named Alan Hall. He was like a vice president. He was articulate. He was sharp. He dressed really, really nice. As a matter of fact, he wore Italian shoes all the time. That's where I got my flair for Italian shoes. And uh, I just like, ooh, I looked at him like, man, that's what I want to be when I grow up. Well, he had figured out somehow, never told, but kind of figured out that I'd been the one that had cl cleaned that up. And based on that, he invited me to be the technical support guy that would follow him around the country and uh, present. And uh, so I did and started doing that, was always really attentive and did it. Now I discovered sometimes Rich says funny things and I could communicate technology very crisply. So he started letting me communicate. Next thing I know, I'm director of all of technical support of the company. The company ends up going bankrupt, but in the process I'd formed this dear relationship with Alan Hall. And he was always saying, you know, the next thing I want to do is I want to start my own company. And I got this really super interesting thing called temp reps. And in temp reps, uh, this is what we're going to do. And we talk about it as we shared hotel rooms traveling around the United States. Well, the company ended up going bankrupt. Alan went, moved to his basement and did temp reps. And I went and got another job assembling computers. 
Um, fast forward some 30 years, guess who my mentor still is? I texted him this morning. I had a blah. I had a critical <laughs> question. Pretty good juggle. Huh? <laughs> uh, I, I texted him this morning. Guess who my mentor still is? Temp reps became Market Star. Market Star became the number one VC, and now it became the funding and a multi billionaire here in Utah. And so that relationship has been dear and tender, and Alan remains my, my living mentor. So let me strongly encourage you, maybe I'll draw the value equation really quickly, to seek mentors. And this is how you do it intellectual capital plus relationship capital equals financial capital. First of all, get smart. Learn something. Get intelligent and do something good. I don't care whether it's cleaning a floor like I did or a good marketing slogan or whatever else. Then use plus signs or services and kind acts uh, with your key relationship capital and givers. There's this book called Give and Take by Adam Grant that is an amazing book uh, that talks about givers, takers, givers, fakers, takers. And so you need to make sure that you're truly working with good benevolent givers, but serve your relationship capital. If you do it in the form of uh, a business, it always makes money. The challenge is that so many people think, I'm gonna get super, super smart. I'm gonna learn how to do option derivative training. Then I'm gonna proceed to use minus signs, take advantage of all the people, all the clients in my network, and oh, I'll destroy it, and that's going to yield money. That does not sustain. And so I challenge you to find the good people. I was so touched yesterday as we were on the phone. We had a, a call yesterday with, uh, with well, Stephen Lisenby, I think he's left, and then the president, and uh, uh, Stu. Where's Stu at? And I was so touched with the first thing that Stephen said. He's, he very politely, do you know how you know when you're talking to the real deal? You guys heard Corey. Go try finding Corey's title, Corey Shelley. Go try finding a title about him. I dare you to look up Stephen Hurth and figure out in heaven or earth what that man does. Okay? If you can figure it out, you're better than me. I've known him very intimately now for, oh, a year. I still don't know everything that he does, and that is the real deal. But what he did share is, is, is I have four structures where I serve and give people. And each day I wake up and I look for four meaningful ways to impact humanity. I have a family office. I have a philanthropic organization. I have a bank. And I have a, uh, a, a shared fund, like any one of those four. It's like, whoa. But he looks every day for four ways to contribute to relationship capital. What's the most valuable of this? If you could take being Einstein, highest IQ there is, having a very powerful network, or having a billion dollars. By raise of hands, close your eyes. Close your eyes, I just want to get a full for this. How many of you would take being the smartest person in the room? Okay, how many would take having a killer, amazing network? All right. Okay, and how many would you take a billion dollars? <laughs> all right, open your eyes. You got the answer right. First of all, that is not the right answer, and I'll, uh, hopefully at the end of the lecture I'll go into why that isn't. That causes misery and woe and heartache and problems if you do not know how to manage it, and that is very easy to lose. That is not wealth. Most people think that's wealth. That is not wealth, okay? Money is not wealth. What about intellectual capital smarts? That's really good to have and it's really nice, but I'll take this one every single day. You give me a powerful network with influence, it's in trust, and not only is life really enjoyable, but it's also incredibly profound. So I would just really encourage all of you, particularly those of you who voted for this one, to reconsider your answer and understand that this one actually leads to wealth. This is the primary way that creates financial wealth and also a really meaningful, di uh, uh, rich, uh, rewarding life. Okay, that's number one, and I killed that one dead. Get a mentor. 
Did everyone get that loud and clear? Get a mentor. <laughs> get a mentor. That's number one predictor of being a success as an entrepreneur. And it's honestly why we set up the Entrepreneur Leadership Council, is to give you all a chance to plug into powerful mentors. Um, those of you, I, I see a few individuals that were in the finals last night of the S4. Congratulations. <laughs> Neither of you won. You know what? It doesn't matter a bit because the relationship you formed with that ELC is what really matters. And by the way, all the pitches I've had the year, all the businesses, all 51 of them, not one of them would have won the, the pitch competition. So it's not about the money, it's about the relationship. That's number one. Okay, next thing I wanted to talk about as a cheat code is, is I bless you with diversity in your life. I, I bless you that you'll get the richness and understanding of getting outside of Southern Utah. Most of my career was made because I was the token uh, Mormon friend for, uh, from Utah and all my network wanted, you know, this diverse network. And uh, right nor wrong, that was a huge advantage, but you've got to get outside of Utah. Travel to Africa. Eat the, eat the spicy food in Mexico. <laughs> go, to, go to Italy and form this deep, rich relationship and network broad. There's nothing like the richness of salt of life, and I promise you, if you do that, doors will open, you will have unique perspective and insights, and the salt and savor of life will be incredible. So don't get stuck just in Southern Utah mindset. Make sure that you go uh, make friendships uh, across the board and get outside your comfort circle. I can't emphasize that enough, again, not only for success, but also for richness of, uh, of life. Uh, traveling, understanding the people and places of the world, getting a context and understanding, man, now that's powerful. And quite frankly, it's what develops this incredible relationship capital. So that's tip number two is, is get broad. Next one is, is a fun one. Um, I call this uh, area of influence, area of concern. All right, I'm going to pick on someone. Do we got anyone that really loves uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda? Hamilton? Anyone? <laughs> no one likes Hamilton? Yeah, we don't talk about Bruno. No, 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 no. <laughs> come on, somebody. All right, you do. Would you come down here for one minute? And I just forewarn you, I'm going to embarrass the tar out of you. I know. I know, and that's exactly why I called on you. All right. This is going to be, we can't start with the start of this song. <laughs> Do you know what, uh, Hamilton? My yes. name is Alexander Hamilton. All right, so what I'd like you to do, uh, we're attempting to get, we got Condoleezza Rice coming down for commencement this year. Next year, we're attempting to get Lin-Manuel Miranda. And I don't know if we're going to pull it off or not, but that's who I'm attempting to get. So pretty cool. So in commemoration of that, and I'm just feeling like this is such an appropriate song today. Can you sing a little bit? <laughs> you want to just start right there? My okay. name is Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton. And there's a million things I haven't done. But just you wait. Just you wait. All right, now uncross your arms and own it and do it. What? Uncross your arms and own it and do it. Give it one more good go. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Alexander Hamilton. My name is Alexander Hamilton, and there's a million things I haven't done, but just you wait. Just you wait. Put your, <laughs> what's your name? Uh, Kelly DeGraff. Kelly DeGraff. Like that? D E G R A mm -hmm. A F. Where are you from, Kelly? You live in Cedar City. I'm so sorry for putting you on the spot, but I want to point something out that just happened. And if you just stand here for a second while I teach this concept. 
all of us in our life have areas of influence, an area of concern. My executive assistant, Cam, today decided what to put in that jug. It's clearly inside of her area of influence. All of you decided what to wear today. You decided what in the area of influence. In our area of concern, there's all sorts of things to be concerned about, like the weather. I'm terribly concerned about the weather. I got to race like a firefly out of here to get to the airport tonight for a critical meeting tomorrow. I hope the snow, but I can't control the snow. What about Ukraine and Russia? Is that in your area of influence or area of concern? It's in your area of concern. So here's the big mistake that most people make. Most people make, spend like 90% of their energy focusing on the weather and Ukraine and COVID and all the things that's like, oh, oh, you can't control it. Oh, and it just turns into this vomit fest. And also a lot of people spend all their energy right smack dab in the middle of their area of influence. And area of influence is this, again what you have for breakfast and so on and so forth. What we just saw Kelly do was what we need to do in order to gain power. And that is, is focus on the perimeter of uncomfort and discomfort on the area of influence. An amazing thing happens when we do that. our area of influence becomes significant and our area of concern reduces. How many of you gained respect for what just happened here? Kelly DeGraff. Okay, Kelly DeGraff, you just, 120 people were just added to your relationship capital. And how do you feel about yourself now, as hard as that was? Pretty good. Pretty darn stinking good. She might have <laughs> we can probably <laughs> arrange that. So thank you for letting me embarrass you. But all of you, I think you all felt for where Kelly was. I think you all went through that. And I challenge you every day to get outside of your comfort zone and to do the hard things. Because most people run and hide in the very comfortable things. And the real impact occurs right here. If you get up every single day and ask yourself, what's the thing I don't want to do that I really need to do, and then do that, you're going to become like Kelly. So let's give Kelly another round of applause. And thank you. And <laughs> Kelly, are you married yet? No. I think you single-handedly need to give me a thank you because I just got five dates for you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so that's the third thing that I wanted to talk to you about is this area of influence, area of concern. Always operate on that perimeter and increase your area of influence. And those of you that competed last night, that's exactly what you did also. So nothing great happens when you're in either extreme of that. All right, any questions about that? All right, let me think what I was gonna just quickly talk about next, pull from my list. All right, uh, I'm going to do two things really quickly and I'm going to give you a bunch of just little cheat quotes. The next thing I want to talk about is, is how many of you have a setup routine? You have a setup routine, okay. Can I call on someone to say, you raise your hand? Tell me, tell me your setup routine. Uh, like just my daily, like in the morning routine? Just a, just a setup routine, how you trigger yourself into success. Um, well, I start, uh, I heard a quote a few years ago, uh, somebody was talking about, uh, I start with making my bed, right? So accomplishing something right off the bat, it helps me to, um, I guess, basically get in the groove of accomplishing things for the rest of the day. So uh, the first thing I do as I wake up, I drink water and I make my bed. Okay, beautiful. That's a great little setup routine. Would anyone else uh, care to share one really quickly? Other hand, right here. I think for me, it's, uh, it's what I get dressed in. So okay. when I wear a suit, I feel like I can fight the world, get everything ready. And then I, I guess just put my sweats on and my t-shirt on, I'm like, eh. 
it's not worth it. I'm just not just gonna do whatever. But yeah, like when I'm dressed up, and I feel like I'm gonna achieve everything. So. Okay, thank you. So indeed, those are daily setup routines. I want to ta teach you something a little bit different, and I'm going to give you a cheat code that all the professional athletes, all the great performers, even myself, before I got here, I had a setup routine. I first learned this in all gravity. There's an individual named Bo Isom. Have any of you heard of Bo? He was a safety for like one of the football teams, and then he did a one-man show on Broadway, and he is terrifying. As a speakers, we hate to go after Bo because he is that good. I'm sitting there having a conversation. We're talking on a place back in Boston. We're going on, and he's sitting there. We're sitting there like that, and he's sitting there talking to me, and he's like all cool looking, and I'm like all nerdy looking like I was in high school. And he's sitting there, and we're talking, talking. All of a sudden, he does that. And I'm like, well, that was weird. <laughs> She's just okay. And I'm sitting there, and he comes back, walks back to me, and starts talking, talking, talking. And I'm blah, blah, blah. And, it's like, <laughs> and I finally says, what the heck, Bo? <laughs> What's going on? He says, oh, that's my setup routine. Uh, that, that anytime before I go on stage, that's what I do. And then a, a, a guy named Warren walked up and says, oh yeah, Rich, don't you have a setup routine? I, I says, I don't have a setup routine. And so I started studying, got way, way into it. And what I discovered that uh, uh, the limbic part of the brain, which is where we live most of our time, is really, really poor performing. And it's the thing that gets us all escalated. Oh, like before you go into a test and you're all escalated. Ah, 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 ah. That's not a very good place to be. And so if you, all the professional athletes have some setup routine to, and it typically involves a breath. Do that. See how that feels compared to. Okay, so getting a setup routine helps you perform dramatically different. Right after that, Jordan Spieth was like on Amen Corner on the Masters. We just got to the Masters. He like dumped three in Amen Corner into that little drink. And they interviewed him and says, what happened? He says, oh, I forgot my breath and setup routine. And it's like, oh, okay, I got, I got the end. It freaks my sons out because like Donovan Mitchell, I can tell every time he's going to miss a foul shot now because he gets out of routine on his setup routine. And, and watch what he does when he gets to the foul line, how he spins the ball, closes his eyes, take the breath, and if he gets out of rhythm, he missed the foul shot. So the question I would ask you and encourage you is, what is your setup routine before you go into a test? What's your setup routine before you do anything that is challenged to get you out of limbic brain into frontal cortex? And I will tell you 100% now, every high performer that I know, and I get a chance to be around a fair number of them, has a setup routine. So that's my next cheat code for you, is get a setup routine. And when, you, uh, when your grades go up from Bs to As, uh, send me a note and thank me. All right, uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is, is the content that I've been working on the last little bit, maybe the, 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 the most important uh, thought leadership that I've put forward uh, to, to date. Um, you guys are in college and you're focus very much on being successful entrepreneurs. Um, when I get done here, I'm going to meet with the billionaire family. It's going to be a very different conversation than the conversation we're having today. Uh, what do you think that conversation is about? What do you think the conversations I'm having are about? Any, any guesses? I'd love some feedback. Come on, give me, give me conversations. What are the billionaires talking about? Skiing. Huh? Skiing. Skiing. Okay, skiing. All right. Self-development ideas. Self-development. Are you talking about SUVs? No. I'm talking about, so the really, really wealthy, the real influencers, What's the conversation that they're having behind closed doors? What's the conversation that they want to talk about when they're being fully disclosed that they really are important to them? You guys, I think if you had a chance, oh, let's, how do I make a million dollars, right? Oh, 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 how do I pay off my coach? That's what gets you excited. But what are the really wealthy, successful families? What's the conversation they're having? Their goals. Goals, okay. Getting a little warmer. Huh? Ideas that they have. Ideas they have. Uh, slightly warmer. Family. Family. Now we're starting to get there. Now we're really starting to get there. How hard is it to become a millionaire? 
Who thinks it's really hard? Okay, really hard? Okay, how thinks it's really easy? What would you guys say if I said I could have you guys all millionaires within six weeks? Who would believe me? Let's go. <laughs> let's go or let's not go. Uh, what if I says all you have to do is just go down south of the border and pick up a, little, a few little duffel bags and get them back across the border? <laughs> now, how do you feel, now how do you feel about it? Okay, you grab a helicopter, but you're still in, <laughs> right? So here's what's really, really hard. It's not that hard. I've done it 16 times. It takes work. It's effort. It takes discipline. You can do it. You could do it. The question is, can you do it in a moral, really good way that adds value? That's number one. That's number one is, can you do it? And then the really hard one is, can you do it without blowing up your trust and family relationships? Now, that's really, 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 really hard. That's really, really hard, unless you follow some really careful protocols. Here's the biggest challenge. I have this dear friend named Scott Ford, and I'm going to be bringing him to campus here. I think next year I'm going to try getting him to campus. And this is just one of the most beautiful, spectacular, thoughtful, amazing men I've ever met. And uh, he teaches this beautiful principle that's called seven-generation thinking. We got the Constitution of the United States largely from the Arakwee Nation. Did you guys know that? That a lot of the concepts came from the Native American Arakwee Nation. Uh, as liberty and right. But we left two key things out. First of all, we left out the role of women. <laughs> we left out the role of women. Did you know in that nation that you cannot go to war unless the women vote for it, the elder women vote for it? And guess who gets to determine who the chief is? That would be the women. <laughs> so where would we be in the country now if we had that kind of philosophy? And then the second and most beautiful uh, concept that was taught was is what's called seven generation thinking. So any decision made, like if your education and what you're going to do, you don't look just at where you're at, but you go back any key decision, you look back and what are three generations back and the wisdom of three generations back? And what did we learn from three generations back? Pretty profound, right? Then in contrast of the decision I make now, how does it affect three generations forward? So the impact of what I do, like if I go cruising into Ukraine, for example, what's the learning of the past? Oh, there's this little thing called uh, World War II. Uh, whew, where would we be at if we were exercising seven generation thinking right now in the government and in your life? So, so powerful if you apply that concept to your life. Um, Working with these uh, really wealthy families, we talk a lot about seven generation uh, thinking and it, it really boils down to three things with these wealthy families. What impact did I have for good? What did I do for good? That's number one. Number two is did my life matter or did I do more damage than good? And number three, who loves me? And who do I love? And how do I repair those relationships? And oftentimes it's blood and carnage. Uh, I'm going to draw just a quick little model for you. And then, oh, let's see. Oh, I got to go really quickly. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it anyway. Middle way. I really uh, love the concept of the middle way or balance. And frequently what happens is, is in our lives, I'm going to draw a couple of infinity symbols here. We start, at, we're going to create a business, we're going to do whatever it takes, we get really hot, we go like super crazy hot, kind of like you young entrepreneurs are, and my zigzag principle taught this, uh, drive into this level of just insanity, sleeping under the desk, do whatever it takes at all costs. I felt sorry for the eco guys presenting last night because it's like, I don't even come home at night, don't even sleep, I'm trying to get my business going. That's too hot and too out of balance. It then hits a point in your business where it does get in balance. You start getting success. Then you get some wealth. This is a little askew. It should probably be more like that, but you get the idea. Get in balance. You get some wealth. You start amassing. But then it gets stupid. And the crazy wealthy families drop into hell. 
They start investing in dark things that bring a lot of wealth. They fund, they trust fund babies where here, all because you were born, you got a billion dollars and float around. And I was with a family a couple of months ago and uh, it, I, I, we, the, we call this, you know, the, the dark death side of things. Um, and I was with this billionaire family and he's sitting there and, and I get into the second day and the wife is sitting there and she starts crying, crying, crying in the second day and saying, oh, my daughter, uh, my daughter, it's like, uh, she's got a, a, two children and her husband's a heroin addict and she goes off with Paris Hilton and pours beer on her breasts and it's all over the tabloids every week and what about my grandkids? And then the grandfather throws a glass on the floor and I'm like, whoa, it's like, oh boy. And he said, I got grandchildren, I got grandchildren. My son takes our yacht and floats around the country or around the world and I get a, I, I get a new grandbaby in every port of call he stops in. I just don't know who they are. Now that's, char that's hard, that's challenging dropping into that. And that's why you hear any wealth carving out of it takes three generations. And oftentimes the wealth is lost. The, did you know that the, the, the uh, Vanderbilts had more money than the national treasury? They lost it in two and a half generations. Now that's an accomplishment. <laughs> I mean, picture owning the wealth of the United States and losing it all. I used to blame, and that's just the stupid kids, but I've come to the conclusion, no, no, no. They realize it's not serving them well. So at that point, you have to carve yourself. So this is wealth, this is business, this is family. Or no, this is personal development. So most of the time, terrible addictions, terrible abuse. Uh, it's where real dark, heavy stuff happens, and it takes typically three generations to climb out of that then back in balance personally, then balance in family, and then back into the same cycle, falling down really quickly. So one of the biggest challenges of entrepreneurs that I've seen, and why, I mean, I've had a really amazing life, but the most amazing, remarkable thing about me is I, look, my son loves me. He actually loves me, wants to throw Frisbee with me, and I didn't blow that up. My wife still loves me. That's why all the wealthy, wealthy, they want to be rich Christians. And it's not because of the wealth or the influence of the book. It's because managing to stabilize and have really healthy relationships. And that's why I say that part's hard, hard, hard. Okay, I've got five minutes. I'm going to go really quickly. The trick is simply this. Tip this over so that you're living in balance in your personal life, your business life, your family life, and in your wealth life, and live in flow with an infinite symbol. That's called the infinite entrepreneur rather than dropping down. Can it be done? Absolutely yes. Now I'm going to go like crazy fast and give you the platform. Here's how you do it. Set your values. Get really clear on your platform of values of what you believe in as a family, a tribe, non-traditional family. Then throw the ones that don't serve you well into the garbage can. The challenge that so many of, particularly the millennials had is, is oh, we don't like all this stuff, so throw 100,000 years of learned wisdom into the garbage can. Don't do that, really stupid. Just extract the stuff that does not work and throw it into the garbage can. Then on top of that platform, place symbols in your family. Yes, a family logo. What's your family spirit animal? What's your spirit animal? What's your uh, anti-persona? What color do you manifest? So get symbology to unify you and your family. Then. Establish doctrine. Create doctrine in your family. Family mission statements. Do you have a family song? If not, that's how you stabilize it and get it and unify. So family uh, uh, mantras and slogans and doctrine and we will believe statements. The third one is, is put in place cadences of, of traditions that you get really bonded with. And then the, the last one is, is embed rites of passage. Then you can put the financial structure and then it holds water. Uh, that's the content indeed and, and what these uh, very wealthy families are totally captivated with. And here's what I would make the statement to you. If you put the effort in to get it built stronger, because I guarantee you, you, I just dead guarantee you, 10 of you in this room will be multimillionaires. You don't believe it now? At least 10 of you will be. And that's not the hardest, and others will choose not to, and that's great because it's better to have a healthy family, wonderful, good life, an enjoyable life, than it is even to mess the, the, the wealth. 
the, the most sad, difficult, hard situation I see in my life is right here. I'd rather live in a tent on the street than be some of these really sad, hard, difficult families in their life. So wealth, I guess I end where I started. Wealth has nothing to do with money. It has to do with your health, has to do with your trust relationships, and most of all, it has to do with your family and a living a joyful and integrity life. Thanks for letting me rant at you today. I think we got two minutes, so any final questions or can we put a wrap on this? With a commitment, I will get Stephen Earth here next time. <laughs> Yes. Um, so a question about like starting up businesses. Um, you know, some of us in here have done that in the past. I've done that and it hasn't gone so well. So what is your advice on how to like rebound if your business has like not performed as you hope it Guard relic, get it over it quickly and fell efficiently. You just put how much money, how much time. I've found it, I've found I've had more failures. I've failed nineteen times. The trick is is fell really quickly. Just fell quickly and get over with it and quit licking. Yeah, don't, don't feel sorry for yourself. Sheesh. Don't, don't feel serious. Get over it already. And just go do it. It's just a, a matter of games. It's not like three strikes, I'm out. No. It's like my first time, it took me seven times. It took me seven times. So if you fell seven times, I'll feel sorry for you. Till then, get over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously, guardrail it. Quick failures, that's my model. Quick, quick, efficient failures. I love failures, love them. Just do it really quickly and don't go bankrupt doing it. Okay, here in the back. What's that? Uh, what do you feel for you for starting so many businesses even after you've been successful so many times? I don't operate anymore, I don't operate. Uh, the, f for me it was quite frankly psychosis and brain damage. Truth. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 51's a bit much. <laughs> but I don't operate. I don't operate anymore. But it was. It, it is fun. It's. Fun. I, I enjoyed it. Loved fun. The hunt, the challenge, and I got really good at doing it. So, and you can have impact doing it. It's amazing the impact you can have with good when you own a business. And, and there's nothing better you can control your life than owning your own business. There's no better way to control your life than owning your own business. All right, thanks guys.